Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Alpha Bunga Bunga. It's Tuesday, the 30th of, of November. I'm Alex Hochuli. I'm joined, as usual, by Philip Cunliffe. Uh, hi, Phil. Hey, how's it going? Uh, our uh, punning quotient will be significantly reduced today because uh, George Hoare is away, so no George today. But we're joined by Douglas Lane. Hi, Doug. Hi. Glad to be on. Yeah, very good to have you back on. Uh, listeners will probably know you as, uh, or will have known you as the publisher of Zero Books, but he's now uh, off starting new ventures, uh, specifically at Diet Soap, which is a, a soon to be a media empire, but uh, for the moment is a, a YouTube channel, a podcast, and soon to be a publishing house. We're looking forward to uh, to seeing what DSM has, uh, has in store for us. Uh, we're going to be talking about that and Doug's plans uh, in just a bit. And uh, we're also going to be talking a little bit more widely about other things. But uh, these, these have been, I guess, turbulent times. Doug, uh, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. It's been a kind of a rough year, but I'm, I'm all right. I, I've come out the other side of it, I hope. Well, soon enough, we'll see what 2022 sounds like. It'll yeah, I mean, so... So, so for listeners, I mean, th- th- this might be a little bit inside baseball, as Americans like to say, but we're going to talk a little bit about what happened uh, with Zero Books. Um, but mm-hmm. we're also going to dedicate a lot more of the time talking about, well, about the left, uh, which is our favorite subject, but, uh, but about the Gen X left in comparison to the millennial mm-hmm. left um, mm-hmm. and where we are today. Um, because we're going to be talking a little bit about No Logo, um, my favorite book when I was 15 for about three months, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> is no indication whatsoever as to its quality because I was an idiot. Eh, but you're supposed to be an idiot at that age, I suppose. Yeah. Seen but not heard. Uh, that's my attitude. Anyway, um, so I actually wanted to start this off by by uh, referring to an upcoming video uh, that you're doing for Diet Soap. Uh, you sent me the script of it uh, where you asked provocatively, is it time for the left to start defending neoliberalism? And uh, the answer, and I guess apologies for the spoiler here, is no, of course no. Um, And actually, I'd probably add, and and you hint at this as well, is that the reality is that in light of a supposed nationalist backlash, Trump, et cetera, et cetera, the left has actually been defending neoliberalism in recent years. Uh, and which is a point that we make, we make it in the end of the end of history, our book, which is published uh, on on zero books, uh, that the left faced with the end of the end of history has largely cowered from the new realities uh, and the new openings that this period might afford and actually has been affected by by knobs, by neoliberal order breakdown syndrome, almost as much as the liberal mainstream and probably more than uh, traditional conservatives have. So we're going to be talking about the left uh, in just a little bit in in, in trying to connect up some different discussions about the left, because there's the one that we present in in the book in the end of the end of history, uh, which came out five months ago on on Zero Books. And if you haven't bought a copy yet, I'm amazed because you're listening to this podcast and you haven't bought it yet. But, um, you know, there's still time. It's still out there being sold. Um, but so, so the, the history that we present there, especially in the introduction, is kind of a potted history of what the left has done over the past 30 years and what changed as of maybe 2016. But also, uh, Doug, you've been putting out videos on your channels and podcasts and these great 20 minute YouTube videos, which you're continuing to do on, on Diet Soap now on critical theory and the left and which often deals with things like questions like the legacies of the new left and kind of how the left has transformed over uh, recent periods and trying to provide listeners and start a discussion, I guess, to generate a sort of sense of greater self-consciousness about what the left is um, and what the kind of historical possibilities are today. Uh, We're going to get to all of this and I should stop talking um, and I bring Doug in because uh, I guess that just the simple question is zero books, what happened to the extent that you can talk about it because there may be some legal issues with certain things. Um, But uh, just give us uh, for listeners who won't be familiar with this, won't have followed this sort of inside lefty stuff, uh, what's actually happened. Well, I want to start by saying what didn't happen. What didn't happen is that I didn't I, I, I was not fired because I tweeted that I like Dave Chappelle. That didn't happen. That that, um, that that was the rumor that people were passing around. I I, I discovered uh, some people with with a lot of uh, glee were 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 you know celebrating the demise of the shitlord Doug Lane, um, but that's not what happened. What happened is do you um, like? But do you like Dave, um, Dave Chappelle? I do like Dave Chappelle. Yeah, All right. I just I, just I think it's funny. Would would have been a yeah. better story, I guess. But you know, <laughs> let's go with the truth. <laughs> yeah, I did tweet in support of Dave Chappelle at an inopportune moment. And I was ratioed quite severely for it, but that did not uh, lead to my termination. So, um, 
What happened instead was that uh, John Hunt of John Hunt Publishing sold his company, all of it, not just zero books, but all the imprints to Watkins Publishing. And Watkins Publishing is the uh, parent company of a, uh, an imprint called Repeater. And Repeater is the imprint that uh, Tariq Goddard and others started av- when they left Zero Books in 2014. So when Watkins um, pu- uh, uh, Publishing purchased John Hunt Publishing, what that meant was the Repeater, the people at Repeater were getting their imprint back. They When they left um, John Hunt Publishing originally, they had intended to bring Zero Books with them wherever they were going next. Uh, John Hunt, who owned the imprint, did not let them. Um, and they spent, I guess, the last six years want, pining away for it. So they've gotten it back. And um, good for them, because they published a lot of good stuff when they were there. I'm sure they'll continue to publish interesting books going forward. Uh, so that wasn't really the, uh, an issue of, uh, in dispute. Um, but when they got the, the imprint back, I was either let go or demoted or something. I was told no longer to do my job, which was to select books to publish and uh, issue contracts, that, that I was not going to be doing that going forward, that Repeater wanted zero books. That's what I was told. And which was just, you know, disconcerting because it meant I didn't have a job as far as I could tell. <laughs> but the other thing that happened was um, uh, the YouTube channel and Patreon that I had set up uh, while I was at zero books was apparently sold as a part of the, the, the deal. And that I didn't appreciate because uh, I thought of it as my own. I was a freelancer working without a contract. Um, and th- that meant the rights were mine to the content I produced. As far as yeah. I could tell, I kept actually asking for a contract that would spell out that I was holding onto those rights and was sort of told, oh, in principle, we would agree with you, that kind of thing. Um, but I didn't ever get one. So no contract was ever put forward. However, at this point, I should say unequivocally that I have relinquished all claims to the YouTube channel and the previous Patreon, um, that I have no legal rights to them anymore. And the people at Repeater and uh, at Watkins do, they own those channels now. So um, that's all behind me. But that was what the dispute was really about, was whether or not I could hold on to those. Um, Before we go any further, uh, I'm going to say this now, but I'm going to say it later as well, that listeners should follow Doug's channels uh doug why don't you tell us where uh to find them given that you had to relinquish control of the previous previous yeah so the the big one to go to is patreon Patreon patreon.com backslash diet soap um that's where you can give me your money and then if you want to follow me on youtube which you absolutely should as well uh just search for douglas lane or it's youtube backslash doug lane um and you'll find my youtube channel which is a continuation to a large degree of what I was doing before. Um, some of the thumbnails might look a little different than how they looked at the other place, but uh, pretty much it's the same stuff. It podcasts on a weekly basis, critical theory, montage videos, and um, a few more things are going to come along. A pop the left will come back, for instance. Excellent. Well, what, what was pop the left for? I mean, I, I used to listen to it ages ago. Uh, pop but the yeah, left was me. what I did with Derek Varn so that he would get a chance on a biweekly basis to yell at me. Um, but, um, but it was a, it was a history. We, we looked at the history of socialism and tried to, uh, at, at the same time, um, pop the illusions of the contemporary left and enter and, and comment on the contemporary scene as well. So we would, we would look through the history of uh, socialism in a kind of eclectic or uh, arbitrary way. We didn't start at the beginning and go all the way to the end or anything like that, but we would, we did a whole sec- uh, series on utopian socialism. Uh, we did a, a question, the question of dual power. Um, we looked at the revolution of 1848, those kinds of, we would just sort of cover historical moments and thinkers. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, I would be told uh, all the ways in which I, I was wrong um, uh, in, in, in private parrot room struggle sessions for patrons only uh yeah no very good so yeah that people should definitely go and check out um i mean i have to say that following this uh you know kind of from afar as it were i mean not being directly connected but obviously you know being friends with you on facebook and seeing what's coming out and all that it's all you know kind of unedifying and this kind of squabbling and you have to say that some of the statements that the uh 
what are they called continuity zero books or but anyway the repeater books people are yeah. uh it just kind of, it seems unnecessary and incredibly petty. Um, and I, people who uh, maybe know less than I do have asked me even like, oh, what's the, you know, what's the in on this? Like, what what's the politics behind this? Because whenever there's some sort of, you know, put it, put it in kind of general terms, like left split, oh. you want to be like, oh, what's the what's the politics behind this? What are the implications here? Um, do, you, do you think that there's nothing or, I mean, because they've made some statements like, uh, you know, some insinuations that there is general populist infiltration, you know, around the world, but also at zero books and things like this, which. Uh... Yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, I would say that. Uh, frankly, I haven't paid enough attention to what repeater books did to know what their politics are. Um, so I can't speak to what their politics are in any competent way, but I will say that uh in terms of some of the allegations that were put forward about the, our supposed rightward turn, um, I don't think that that holds up to scrutiny because, um, for instance, a big deal has been made about Zero Book's relationship with Spiked. Uh, Philip, you you are part of the problem here. Um, uh, believe me, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so Philip was named in many this. Years. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the truth is that before I started at Zero Books, the, the, the imprint had published a, a number of, of people who were affiliated with Spiked. Um, so that's not a change. And I would stand behind any of the books that we published. Uh, and I don't think any of them are reactionary. Although I am not uh, uh, overall um, aligned with Spiked. I think that, uh, that, that overall that like Spiked has given up on the working class way too much. and. Um, and, you know, I think Brendan O'Neill is uh, kind of a, a, a shadow of his former self. He's, he's become one of these anti-woke uh, people who, you know, it's, it's just, it's boring at this point. Um, but uh, yeah, so that would be one thing that uh, I was accused of. The other thing that would sometimes happen is I get a, a smeared as a publisher of a guy named Gilad Atzman. I think that's how you say it. I'm not sure. Yeah. But he was, a, he's a, He's an anti-Semite um, yeah. and a Jew and Israeli. And the book that was published was called The Wandering Who, which I worked to get off of the imprint's back catalog and shifted to another imprint that JHP owned, which was like a compromise position. Um, yeah, I mean, so that was published again by the previous, the people who are taking it now, uh, they published that. I'm sure they thought they now regret it, but um, there was a scandal around that book. And I'm usually pretty much completely like a free speech absolutist, but that book turned my stomach and, and that I went as an editorial speech. decision, not necessarily as a question of free speech, but as an editorial. Right, exactly. I would never have published that, yeah. that book. Um, uh, so you also, there yeah. was also flack for um, Angela Nagel's book, given subsequent, I mean, her criticisms of the left in, in, um, in Kill All Normies, but then also subsequently the position she took on immigration. And I mean, what struck me as odd about that also was the idea that publishers, um, you know, have to kind of agree with everything that their writers, their writers right, say. Yeah. An absurd, an absurd position, entirely absurd. Right. I mean, what, the thing about Angel Nagel is, um, I really, actually, her book Kill All Normies is one of the, the high points, I think, uh, for the time I was at Zero. It did really yeah. well. It was timed well. It was a really good book, um, despite some of the copy editing problems it was well written um uh, i so i would absolutely stand by kill all normies as a book people should still read it, angela nagel's turn i can't make heads or tails out of it. i don't i mean her position on uh open borders is one thing um since then she's also kind of gone on an anti-left uh tear i think a little bit which i am critical of um overall uh, though my position has been like towards all the books that we publish that uh, because I do what's called content marketing, meaning I create videos and podcasts to get people's attention for the books, I'm not constrained to like or agree with the authors that we publish. So like I was critical of, of Nagel uh, uh, yeah. around the, the question of immigration. Um, I think I think in a pretty fair way. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I, I wouldn't again, like I wouldn't back down from having supported that book and and be, being proud of uh, publishing it if nagel wanted to write a book 
that was on the left socialist book that was as good as that one I would publish her again, despite some of her statements. But I, um, I'm not that keen on the anti-left uh, Marxists or whatever. Uh, and you know, uh, that doesn't mean I, you know, would never work with any of them. But I just don't. Uh, I'm, I'm not aligned with that position. Well, I mean, we can get onto some of that in a bit. I mean, I think part of what you've all just said really is that. But it speaks to the problem of the desire to enforce orthodox on the left, guilt by association, the insistence that uh, a publisher, for example, or a magazine be held accountable for every single thing that they publish. Not that things shouldn't be argued about or that, you know, if, a, say, a magazine publishes an article which is terrible, uh, people that, that that shouldn't be argued about, but the kind of... Um, not people just not understanding really uh, the difference between free speech and editorial decisions, uh, trying to hold people to account for uh, for providing a kind of wide platform for different people, all these kinds of things. Uh, basically, it, to, to sum it up, I guess, the left's aversion to open debate. Yeah, I mean, I think in this case, most of those charges when they're coming from the people who are taking uh who purchased zero books um they, they didn't take anything they bought it um the, I, I think it's just opportunism i don't think that they that that's really what's behind it the, the main the main charge that was leveled at me for years was that i was a scab because i took the job of being the publishing manager after they had quit and started another imprint but weren't allowed to take the brand with them um I don't, I don't think that, I, I think calling me a scab is the wrong word. I, maybe from their perspective, I was a jerk, but I, I wasn't a scab. Well, and that, that's uh, another thing, reaching, <laughs> reaching for kind of larger political terms with wider significations when maybe someone's just being a jerk as, as a suggestion. But, I'm not calling but I mean, you a jerk. From my but... perspective, um, from my perspective, look, it was, it was a great opportunity to uh, take a job that I really enjoy doing and um, I didn't tell them that they couldn't take the imprint, uh, with them. That was John Hunt. And, you know, I didn't know them. I was this American, this unwashed, uncouth, ugly American to stepping in. I didn't even know when tea time was, you know? Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so yeah. Um, but in any case, I think that's really what's behind some of the animosity you're, you're hearing from them is this sort of longstanding resentment. Um, there was pop probably originally aimed at John Hunt and just sort of like I got some of it because I continued the imprint past the point when they would have wanted it to continue. So I suppose broadening out the discussion then from um, and given you're in the position of launching something new um, mm -hmm. and your experience that you've just been recounting, how do you see the task of left media and publishing? Um, and is it about, in, is it like something like preserving a certain kind of method or approach? Um, or is it to innovate something new and to build constituencies where they don't exist at the moment? Well, I would love to try to build constituencies or, or bring people into a, a movement or a party. But I don't think that's what uh, Daiso Media is going to be designed to do. Um, if anything what i mean we're going to publish we already have a uh, our first book uh selected it's todd mcgowan's book called enjoying it right and left oh excellent um, that's a good good author to start with that's really great yeah and the the point of of the, what we're trying to do now going forward is we're going to publish fewer books than i did at zero um and we're going to uh, select them with a, you know a bit more care and uh the idea is to try to introduce the notion of dialectical thinking to the Anglophone left, um, to try to get over some of the, try to move past the impasse and break from the tendency to repeat um, and, by, and just go back into the earlier problems um, by pushing this idea that you can't um, uh, truly understand a political problem or a contradiction in society simply by taking a one-sided moralistic view of it. So like, for instance, on the question of family values, um, the progressive far left often takes an anti-family stance, sees the uh, institution as patriarchal, oppressive of women, yeah. uh, 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 
you know, backwards, often uh, religious in ways that are detrimental to human freedom um, and so on. Uh, I don't disagree with a lot of that assessment of the family, but at the same time, I feel as though the left should recognize that it is also, as Christopher Lash said, a haven in a heartless world. It's a realm of, uh, of meaning and of uh, personal connection um, uh, and intimacy. And as broken as it is and as dysfunctional as it is because of the way it's situated in a world that is heartless and cruel and alien, um, nonetheless, it can't simply be rejected. You know, so um, thinking through what the left's relationship should be to uh, the family, what kind of what kinds of supports working class families need, and and what our uh, attitudes might be, uh, you know, would, would be something that I would want to tackle um, uh, going forward. You know, there's actually a book on yeah. the family that might be coming out as well. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't disagree that the more dialectical approach to these questions is absolutely needed. I guess maybe to play devil's advocate on this, actually, because it doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. represent my view exactly. But the, I think the argument on the part of some is that the general trend in capitalism, to put it simply, is is to uh, is you know fragmentary, dissolving the family, etc. Basically, uh, impeding the possibility even of, of developing kind of a family or a stable sort of home life or anything like that, and that therefore it is an imperative to somehow do the opposite to defend the family uh, against and if even whatever points of progressive the progressive left might have, uh, ultimately they are on the side of capitalism. They're, they're, they're on the side of the disintegrative forces, and therefore you need to defend the family. I mean, somebody that's that's an argument that someone would make. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, okay. So like, uh, I, I think you go too far to say that the people who are critiquing the family for uh, along the lines that I originally stated are on the side of capitalism, because that's the, the weird thing about capitalism is that if you're trying to preserve the family, you're also on the side of capitalism because capitalism is a contradictory meandering force and this certainly ideologically and culturally. And so like defending the family, attacking the family, both things are service capital in different historical moments, you know. Um, but I think what needs to be recognized is that the, what the conservative pro-family position uh, has right is that working class people, all people, but specifically working class people because they're the radical subjects here, require a, a stable, meaningful life of connection in order to be able to start functioning as agents of change. And so when we uh, think about uh, what kinds of supports we need to, to give or what kinds of policies or pr proposals or movements we wanna make, we should not be allergic to some of them that are in support of family life. And it, like for instance, uh, parental rights or something like that, that yeah. not, that's not always a conservative thing to, to struggle for, um, but it, it does depend on the moment. No, I, th I think that that's absolutely correct. I think as a as a task uh, or as a way to conceive of an intellectual project. I think today. Um, so I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm interested also to see what you guys publish uh, going forward. But uh, but for now, I think uh, we do have to revisit the trauma uh, <laughs> right now and we'll talk about uh, Gen well, X. Uh, in the, the Gen in, X left. The big trauma for me is my is my divorce. By the way, <laughs> speaking of family, so it's, it's, we very, won't it's much more that. immediate. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're talking about, about uh, deep buried traumas of, uh, of Generation okay. X. Um, so mm -hmm. you've written this thing about no logo, which, if anything, I think pretty much sums up the Gen X left, or I guess it's the later end of Gen X, uh, really, mm -hmm. because uh, the Gen, Gen X left as listeners to, uh, to our series, uh, OK Boonger, on the history of generational conflict uh, will have heard, you know, that the generation X is the, the generation of the end of history and some ha sense uh, contained mm -hmm. all those disappointments, uh, disappointments of the failures of 68 and that whole moment. And also uh, the experience of a rising neoliberalism and the end of the OSSR and all the rest. Um, mm -hmm. But no, but let's talk about no logo specifically because you've uh, just written this thing. Well, we, I read the script that you, uh, that you sent me for the video that you're putting out. And it's interesting that, 
that sort of anti-branding attitude, anti-advertising, all that kind of uh, no logo, uh, ad busters politics, which was very of the moment in the mid 90s, late 90s, has completely mm-hmm. disappeared. And maybe it's that we're now too cynical and that we don't even buy advertising. So you can't even say, hey, stop buying into what the advertising users are telling you. Or alternatively, that we are now all marketeers ourselves and that we've been fully subsumed. I just want to contest this idea that it's completely disappeared because Adbusters still exists. It's <laughs> out I mean, the Adbusters put out in, in the Pacific college. Northwest where you live. I, 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 I totally understand that that might still be a thing. I, I'm talking about what I know. Okay, yeah, yeah, it might be different. No, no. I mean, you're right that, that uh, as far as being a dominant voice on the left, it did disappear. But, you know, it didn't disappear in 99. It disappeared after 2011. Adbusters and uh, was part of the Occupy movement. I think it was, I think it was Adbusters that put forward the call. Yeah, am, am I Yeah, I think that? that's right. Yeah. Um. So, uh, you know that kind of anti-corporate, uh, anti-advertising, anti-consumerist left dominated, even in after you know, the new normal took hold after 9-11. It, it dominated even after, surprisingly, even after the economic crisis of 2008, which is when I broke from it. You know, uh, that's when I became a Marxist instead of a, I don't know, rad lib anarchist or something. Because um, I didn't, look, when the economic crisis hit, I was working at a uh, call center at Comcast and I wasn't sure, and I had a, a novel in with the publisher and I, I just felt like my, big career ambitions were being dashed upon the rocks of the breaking U.S. economy. And um, and so I realized that my anti-consumerist, you know, uh, austerity-minded anarchism was not of the moment, did not help me at all understand mm. what the reality of politics were after 2008. Returning to No Logo now, in a moment where the issue of branding is, you know, actually on my mind for kind of real personal reasons or particular reasons. Um, I was wanting to know, like, is there something there in Naomi Klein's position that deserves to be taken up again? And it certainly is the case that the, the power of branding and the, um, the culture, the corporate culture that, that we were railing against in the 80s and 90s and beyond uh, has deepened and changed and mm-hmm. changed um so it there is a there is something to naomi klein's no logo position which and i think it has to do with how uh corporate culture and commodification of all aspects of life changes our understanding of the world uh and our kind of develops an ideology it wasn't um, wasn't it that the i mean what i recall i mean this uh, probably with the benefit of hindsight but I recall it was very quickly absorbed um, and within kind of within very little time at all that you had the, you know, that you'd have ad, it would become kind of part of the syllabus on um, advertising courses, ad execs would be talking about um, no logo, how influential it was, how important it was for their own thinking. Um, and if that's, I think the, that's the process which um, Klein, I think, would struggle to really appreciate into what actually, you know, the very fact that she, that her own kind of anti-consumerism was repackaged as a kind of consumerism. And like you say, now the way in which kind of branding works is that it's, um, it's kind of, uh, I mean, I suppose part of it is that it's gone, if it's become even more normalized and covert, you know, so in the sense that it's, um, product placement, which wasn't really a thing as far as I can recall when um, when Naomi Klein kind of um, um, published no logo, it became a it, it thing was, but in, it was like in big Hollywood movies. It wasn't like yeah, everywhere. I was it wasn't like world. people on TikTok advertising yeah. products. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking mm-hmm. of The Sopranos. So this, you know, the kind of The Sopranos moved into product placement and The Sopranos kind of, um, whereas like, yeah, I mean, I guess it was associated with the big movies, but it didn't become part, yeah, it didn't become TikTok. It wasn't Instagram. It wasn't influencers that whole thing came later and mm-hmm. that i guess is um i mean is that what you mean by the idea that it's become that it's it become amplified yeah yeah so yeah yeah i i think that brands are like like i wonder is doug lane a brand now 
I mean, uh, kind of I am. You right? are. Uh, absolutely, you are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. I support um, that brand against other brands. <laughs> don't, don't worry. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I mean, that would have been that would have been something I might have argued. Um, but but it not that wouldn't be the way I want to argue about these things. And I so like the notion of the general intellect and the the um the the desirability of uh, freely exchanging ideas and using one another's um understanding uh for our own betterment and 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 certainly like uh uh freely creating innov innovative technologies um that's gone by the wayside i mean the there's still i guess a free software movement and i'm gonna actually talk to to one of the advocates of it uh soon but um yeah i do think that we have a conception sort of a mystical conception of what a brand is now that is just m more fundamental to m some people's everyday lives than it had been in the past and you know the obvious thing is like for a while now we all have had a, like an instagram profile or a facebook profile or we're on twitter where we develop our brands even if we're not media yeah people. I, I i've noticed this in in like social media debates on the left where it's in, it's it, it's all spoken about whether people are conscious of it or not, in terms of market positioning, uh, we have positioned ourselves as X. We've come up with a label for whatever our politics is, uh, and we are positioning ourselves like this. So we have to, you know, and it's always um, it's somewhat how preempting how it'll be received and its positioning in the in the sort of marketplace, and that's the kind of level of subsumption which I think is is new. Um, and it's funny because I, I've kind of changed my opinion on this a little bit because my attitude to that whole anti-branding politics, I'm still very critical of it. But mm -hmm. for me, it was like, and as even as we were writing the the the, the book, uh, the end of the end of history, like when we started writing it, which was what two years ago or something like that. Already, mm -hmm. that was a little bit of a different historical moment because there was still the kind of some expectations or little hopes around left populism. Uh, that you know that no logo stuff was completely degenerate, completely obsessed with total simulac or total domination by brands and whatever, and some idea of being outside of capitalism and of alternative culture and stuff. And that was a complete delusion, whereas now we're a little bit smarter because we're talking about power and, okay, maybe too limited to elections, too limited to existing parties, the Labour Party, the Democratic Party, but nevertheless, there's a re-engagement with power. We've left behind the age of, you know, take what, uh, what is uh, John Holloway's book, take... Uh, what does it change the world yeah. without taking power, right? We'd left that behind. Right, right, right. And so mm -hmm. for me, it was not a, just a story of kind of tendential de like decline since then, but that we've, that in some ways there's a resurgence of a moment or a re-engagement with politics, right? The book, the, what we argue in the book. What you're saying here, and I, I kind of agree with it, is that there has maybe been something lost there at, at, in terms of a critical attitude. I think the attitude, what was wrong about Nologo was trying to somehow be outside, somehow trying to carve out a cultural space outside of capitalism. I don't think that's, possible or you know strategically makes any sense but at least there was a more critical attitude towards participating in this whereas now we do it completely gleefully i think kind of there's a bit more though and this i i think i'd push well maybe kind of uh, slice it a different way and this is picking up a bit on what doug suggested about earlier about the kind of the dialectical approach i mean the thing that strikes me the most about kind of branding is that it's kind of a refuge for utopia and this might not be um, a you know a popular thing to say, but I mean, um, you know, it strikes me that it's a kind of it's a car, and it's obviously carved out and individualistic, but it's the realm in which um, you know. So if you think of the Instagram influencer perfectly um, creating um, the perfect shot, you know, like um, and whereas outside of the frame everything looks much worse. You know, there's an effort there to shape a certain vision of life that is, um, you know, that by definition is appealing because lots of people, you know, are attracted to it and they follow the relevant person and so on. And I think the same is generally true of any, um, you know, or a plenty at least of successful advertising campaigns that sell a certain kind of vision of life associated with a product. I mean, I'm always struck, for instance, and maybe this is just how shallow I am, though, um, I'd like to think that it's um, that I'm no, you know, no more shallow than most other people who go to the cinema. But when you see like a car ad in in before um, before the trailers for a movie, I'm always amazed at the production values and the um, the effort, and also the tremendous attention to a certain kind of vision of life that comes with them. 
And those seem to me like it does seem to me to what is appealing about them is that there is a kind of utopian dimension to the way in which brands sell certain kinds of visions of life that you don't get anywhere else, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And certainly not on the left, um, because, you know, the left really is kind of um, so um, absorbed with um, doom mongering for the most part, we you know, with the past partial exception, I suppose, of the fully automated luxury luxury opportunist crowd um but apart from then you know it's well, kind of there is nothing i, I, I want to jump in and, and see if i can add to what you're saying because I, I i agree with it in part and the um there's a background theoretical uh position to this no branding ad busters uh politics and and that it doesn't come from the the 80s or 90s but from the 50s and 60s it's the uh, the SI, the Situationist International, and the books like Society of the Spectacle. And um, so the brand, from like a, the, from the perspective of Guy Debord, would just be one instance of a generalized spectacle uh, where the workers and the, the people in society are put in the position of being mere spectators to history rather than their active agents, right? So... Key to board railed against um, the mediating spectacle of capitalist society. Um, and uh, I think there's some value in his work, but I would say that the vision, I came to the conclusion that his vision of a spectacular society, a society really mediated by imagery and affect and, uh, and, the, uh, and the media was a utopian vision. It's actually what we want. <laughs> what we have is a society mediated by labor and the amount and socially necessary labor time, which he kind of leaves out of his critique, even though he talks about the commodity. Um, so, so why would just why would his vision why why is it a utopian vision actually or an um, well, it, utopian? It, it, because um, we uh, because whenever because real experiences are always. Uh, somewhat alienating like we are never directly uh, experiencing the world we're experiencing the world through lenses and meanings and imagery and, and feelings and notions and all those things are are uh, spectacles you know they're 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 virtual they're, we don't have a direct perception uh, uh, an experience and relationship to the world it's always mediated um and the the spectacle, uh, the 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 idea that we're as Gita Board puts it, though the idea that we're mediated by, you know, Hollywood films and news reports and uh, the feeling of a rock song and uh, a sexy lady on the fashion runway and things like that, like to live in a world where that is actually what determines um, what's produced, how it's distributed, where you end up, what your workday is like, would be utopian in comparison to the kind of world where we're, we actually live in, where what determines where you end up is, you know, how well uh, workers do uh, on the factory floor and what the, uh, what the role of technology is in augmenting and yeah. speeding up production. Yeah. Um, and it's like this book behind me, Bash Bash Revolution, is all about thinking about the spectacle as actually, in a way, utopian. Um, and like going into the spectacle as the utopian solution uh, be beyond um, capitalism. So now having said that, a brand is a property relation. It's not um, merely this uh, an image or a feeling. I mean, it, it is those things, but it's also the, a claim of ownership and a, and a limit around um, those ideas. So, and it's very bad for the left to be branded for left thinkers to be branded because um, then everything you do, and, and this is an unfortunate reality of how things are. I mean, you cannot avoid it, but everything you do is thought of in terms of your brand identity. So like if I decide to interview Glenn Greenwald, that's a decision I'm making that is both based on my actual opinions and what he's saying and the ideas he's putting forward and the arguments that are made, but also about, his brand and my brand <clears throat> and how do those two things interact and and how will other branded identities inter uh, you know perceive me in relationship to their brands and um i think that 
when it comes to like spaces like Twitter, you have a lot of people who aren't even monetizing their brand who consider themselves to be brands and yeah. who relate to other um, thinkers online, you know, other yeah. people on Twitter as yeah. brands. I always wonder about those people. Are they the smart ones or the dumb ones? <laughs> the ones who think of themselves in terms of brand but unmonetized because i think i probably i think i probably fall into that the the unthinking the unthinking brand um so yeah anyway no and, yeah, to, so and to win at twitter you kind of need to if you want to win at twitter which is a stupid thing the stupid yeah. game to play but yeah, when, like when you Dave win at Chappelle twitter says, do they send you an iphone real... or what, 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 what do you get <laughs> No cancellation. Yeah, cancellation place. is the ultimate prize. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, oh I've won already. <laughs> um, yeah, I think there's another aspect. I mean, to also to think about this maybe more politically and the way that this inf uh, influences how we think about politics. Um, and I think more, you know, in a, in a more limited sense uh, of the political, which is in relation to public opinion as well where there's a constant obsession with mood and what the people want. So there's a kind of not just specifically branding, but more marketing, right? We're always obsessed. And we spoke actually the last episode we did, we had a kind of critical discussion, uh, the three of us, Phil, George, myself, about the Jacobin uh, polling survey that they did, opinion survey of working class voters, right? But there's some interesting stuff there. Um, but, you know, it, basically there's, a, there's still this element of like, what are the people thinking? And the thing is, is that when the world used to be organized and when society used to be organized into effectively into parties, into blocks, right? That the people were members of organizations, uh, to a certain extent, the representatives of those organizations, those leaders represented public opinion, right? Represented different views of different sections of society, different interests, mm -hmm. different ideas, et cetera. Today, without that, it's like everyone's become or anybody who's interested in politics or trying to win people over or even just carve out a niche is kind of desperately trying to figure out what the latent demand is to put it in precisely marketing, mm -hmm. marketing terms. Um, mm -hmm. And also spicing up the population into marketing categories. Ah, these are the white working class who are traditionalists, the more left leaning, or these are the, you know, progressive PMC and blah, 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 blah. And we do it ourselves. We, you know, we, we we're constantly kind of doing this kind of marketing categories. Often, in relation to people who aren't saying anything. They're not manifesting themselves in any way. It's just what we assume is in their heads and their, that, it, that are their attitudes and uh, concealed preferences, not revealed yet, or maybe only revealed by who they chose to push the button for at the ballot box. And that's about it, right? The, the level of political agency expressed there is extremely limited, if, if at all. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that's another way in which marketing thinking has uh, infiltrated political thinking. And, and obsesses us. And of course, political marketeers will do that. People who work for political parties, lobbies, blah, 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 will do that and be concerned about that stuff. Let them do it, whatever. We, we can't stop them doing that. But I think it's terrible if us who have some ambition of changing the world um, and not just uh, changing, but, but moving beyond uh, precisely this kind of marketing obsession to then participate in it, it so much as well. Um, I, I'd be more yeah. interested in talking about what people are doing and what the groups of people organized into movements, parties, whatever are doing, than just talking about what people actually want, which is always, to a certain extent, I think, a bit of a stage army. Everybody can point out, well, people actually want this. People actually want this because of what? Because of what people say on social media? Because of what uh, sentiment analysis shows us about social media? Uh, because of polling? This is all. These are all different forms of... Um, somehow creating consensus rather than any real reflection of of actual expressed demand for something well i mean a couple things come to mind one is that when in the early days of podcasting i, I actually read a bit out about marketing and i was trying to figure out how to get my podcast out there and get people to listen to it and um one of the approaches to marketing is this in content marketing but there's another approach where it's audience built content marketing and so the idea is that you go to your audience and ask them what they want, and then you give mm -hmm. it to them. Like yeah. you don't you don't think up what what <clears throat> what you want to put out there, but you you pull your audience and then you know you build a product based on the desires that your audience is, expresses to you. And I guess the testing of whether or not says that that's really what they want is if they pay you for it or not, right? I mean, and the the same thing's true, and when it comes to politics, like you know. It, you do this analysis to find out what people want so that you can create a product in the form of a politician or a political campaign 
And if it gets voted in, then you've done it right. <laughs> you know, yeah. it, so you get, you get paid or you get voted in. Um, so the, the problem, I guess, with this approach, for, well, as someone who likes to write and think and do things, I don't really love the idea of, of creating something that people want. <laughs> I want to change what they want. Yeah. Like I want to yeah. reach in and alter these people. Um, but maybe that's just because I'm a narcissist. But uh, uh, the the other problem with it is that um, it it uh, treats it goes back to this no branding thing uh, or you know the no logo. It treats the political uh, actors, it treats citizens only as consumers. You create a a, a commodity. Yeah or a brand that they want and then you get elected and that's the end of the road it's it's um it doesn't it it is not led by the the voters or the citizens it's not uh it's it's treating them as passive objects that that you survey it's like uh, that's the other problem with it i think the political problem with it yeah and then and then of course you get the competing victimhood version of this where you can find ever narrow segment ever narrow segments of the true victims who uh you know like uh who are the only worthy ones and you can and that's and then you get all the kind of uh sectarian backbiting within intersectionalist politics broadly conceived uh where they attack one another it's like oh but you can't trust white gays you have to you can only listen to the voice of black gays because those are the the, the, yeah the real i mean i think that might so be on. that might that might be a good way to monetize something but i don't think it's a great way to get elected <laughs> no, 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 right. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, the, the, but I want to go to the other side of this no logo thing because I think I've been praising no logo and Klein, I want I want to criticize uh, this book now. The, the problem with no logo and the problem with the politics that were around me at least at the time is that they assumed that like like Gita Bohr did, that what dictates society and, and the outcomes politically in society, are primarily uh, the attitudes and the uh, and the players uh, in society. So the political actors and the attitudes and the policies that they put forward, with, without considering the underlying material forces of things that are, are like around socially necessary labor time and uh, the tendency to rate of profit to decline and those economic barriers and 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 forces um, uh, are kind of ignored, um, and in that. That's why uh, the this sort of the contradictory politics of Naomi Klein could emerge. I mean, she wanted, on the one hand, to kind of return to uh, a nationalist politics and and be concerned with uh, uh, like American workers. I think, um, and at the same time, she was uh, blasting um, the uh, the 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 corporate sector for being um uh colonialist and and uh, not yeah. uh, concerned yeah. enough about the humanity of the of the uh, people in the third world um uh, so you know without realizing that the development would ha- you know that for the, the for the undeveloped nations development would have to be part of the equation and that would have to some degree or another come from the developed world uh, one i mean thinking back i mean to i no logo for me was always kind of absorbed by the anti-globalization movement so that was always what i associated it with mm-hmm. as part of that era and it's interesting what you say like you know she wanted a nationalist politics in a way and they in a sense you know the anti-global thinking back to it now the anti-globalization people got what they wanted and not in the form that they wanted yeah, yeah. i mean they were very excited about the, you know the, the so-called teamsters and turtles alliance the fact that they managed to get um trade unionists marching in seattle with um with environmentalists and that this was seen as a great achievement and at the time um also i think yeah i think i think it was in seattle i mean i, mean, I don't even maybe you were even there i don't know i went on the london um version um in 2000 but the um so if i'm remembering this rightly i think it was in seattle that the uh, the trade unionists dumped brazilian steel into the harbor or something mm-hmm. like that i um, mean protested the fact of um at you know the kind of depredations of nafta and steel dumping by um uh, by you know our competitors with u.s steel 
and so but now you know they subsequently to that they um the you know the trade or the workers at least and the steel tariffs were set up by trump and the working class at least in the northeast kind of swung you know they swung away from um from what the place that had been imagined for them by the anti-globalization movement of earlier and people like naomi klein and others and her allies kind of reacted with horror when you actually had a working class um kind of nationalist populist backlash um in response to globalization in recent years and so all of that you know it strikes me as um i haven't quite worked through how though you know how that politics kind of twisted and turned but that it did essentially they've ended up they've been beaten when they actually saw um you know kind of a revived working class politics of a kind at least in the form of um of trump and brexit and others in the form of populism um they recoiled and they fell back onto defending um neoliberalism effectively in various ways and and that's where they ended up and you know naomi klein still kind of um she's still committed to you know her new thing is um climate and green politics and mm -hmm. so she's still tracing that arc in a sense and is still at least to that extent um you know she's plowed into the green new deal um and that's the kind of vision that um her and the many of the anti-globos now in, have ended up in they've staked their hopes on some kind of supranational state which, which, arrangement yeah i guess i suppose insofar as it would be something that would be implemented like in the us by the federal government, this Green New Deal, that would be in yeah. some sense a bit of a synthesis of their concerns from 20 years earlier. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Mm -hmm. I mean, they would see maybe, you know, some kind of, you know, like building building uh, new green industries and stuff. I imagine that would think, figure as part of their vision. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, um, it's easy to see, though. I mean, I'm kind of sympathetic to uh, Naomi Klein and uh, to the 90s left. Of course, you know, I'm of it, so I, I, might, I might as well be sympathetic uh, to it. Um, but, you know, you make demands that you think are going to be progressive, working class demands to help push the left forward in a, in, let's say, a revolutionary struggle. For instance, you make the demand for $15 an hour minimum wage for everybody to think that will lift up the more impoverished sectors of the working class and allow people to have the stability they need to organize politically. And you get that $15 an hour minimum wage, or at least average, uh, by through inflation and uh, labor shortages. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, you know, the de demand means one thing in a political, in certain historical moment and context and political, uh, reality and then it and when it's met it might mean something uh, completely different and uh, th that's why i think the left has been defending neoliberalism it's not that uh, anyone wants to outright uh defend neoliberalism but they they don't want to lose a hold of any sort of international solidarity that might exist and the only international force right now that there is is a neoliberal one the only way yeah. to cross ethnic uh divides is through a, a kind of neoliberal moralism i mean obviously it's the thinnest of cosmopolitanisms that they end up defending and i mean I, I would argue it probably has very little to do with internationalism and they forget the the nationalism part of internationalism that there's at least a certain struggle in specific places in specific locales which might refer to or engage in a national democracy uh and try to kind of vault over that or ignore that or turn their back on it in the guise of nas internationalism but you know really it's the absence of a struggle on the kind of at the national level which allows them then to in some sense fantasize about an international struggle which is really just um you know leftists online uh talking across borders like we're doing right here uh <laughs> <laughs> hey don't take away that fantasy what no. Left? <laughs> no this is good you know it's good to have debate but you know it would be uh it'd be stupid to pretend that this is some great international internationalist struggle that we're having right here right now right no, um, no you're right um yeah, I mean that's a, that's the trick. You do need national struggles. You need not you need real workers who live in real places to organize politically in their interests in order to have a, a, the beginnings of a movement that might become a party. But you also want to have coordination between yeah different working class sectors around the world. And obviously, the best way to coordinate those workers is through podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. 
<laughs> we, we've, we've had uh, podcasting come in as a solution to so many different issues over the past over the past weeks even but i think it was proposed as a solution to the silent majority give everyone podcasting mics they're no longer silent <laughs> yeah, right. Um, right. anyway but there was something i did want to pick up what you were saying uh, just before that which um mm -hmm. related to um how quickly the left has been outflanked by events and not just so i mean in in one sense the the the, the post 2016 period to some extent um, overtook the period which uh, emerged from the 20, 2008 crisis, which was effectively anti-austerity politics from range from around 2010 until 2016. And it, to mm -hmm. an extent, it sort of continued in the in the left populist period, um, but it's amazing how 2020 and the pandemic and labor shortages and supply chain disruptions and all that has completely well outflanked. Suggests some agency on that part, but it's just capital doing what capital does. So. Uh, uh, or uh, uh, maybe the better way to put it would be superseded or overtaken somehow, um, mm -hmm. not just the the anti-austerity left, but the kind of left populist left in, in exactly the way that you said, right? In terms of, uh, you know, the fight for 15 campaign, suddenly inflation just does that or labor shortages does that, you know, in one fell swoop. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, yeah, this is something that we discuss in our book. It's something we discuss a bit with Adam Tooze as well. Uh, and I guess the question which I want to drive towards to kind of move on to, to kind of a, another section of, of this discussion is uh, when did the left start sucking, or, which is how I have it noted down. But now it's not the, I realize not the best way to phrase it. But I guess it really is the left is constantly not on the back foot as is normally understood, but maybe constantly chasing its own tail. Or maybe that's not the right metaphor either, but um, constantly behind events rather than leaving them. And mm. that's been the case for how long? Maybe that's the right way to phrase it. Um, because to a certain extent, there's an argument made about the new left and the 1960s that they were neoliberal avant la lettre, which is not exactly an interpretation I buy. Um, I think that there's a tendency now on the left to say, well, the 1968 was always terrible. And everything about it was terrible and it was always going to lead to neoliberalism, which ends up being just a diametrical opposite of the other mainstream left attitude of 1968 was great. It's perfect. We should repeat it. That is what left politics always necessarily looks like. And these diametrically opposed visions are, well, they're not dialectical. And I would propose a more dialectical understanding of it, looking at what the actual demands were in 68 and how they got recuperated and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a long-winded way of saying that there was still some sense of a vanguard on the left then, uh, whereas I think in the kind of recent decades, the left has always been kind of behind events and very, and as soon as the world starts changing a little bit more rapidly, becomes overtaken by events very, very quickly as we've seen. Well, um, well I'm going to just talk about 68 for a second. I wrote a novel about May 68, it's called Us about May 68. Um, oh, sorry. Can we can we just sorry, Doug? Can you just retake that because um, it froze for me. Maybe it didn't for you, but it froze here. So let me just take a note of this. Okay, so I'll say it again. Um, I want to talk about May 68. I'll, I'll I, I don't know if that's where it started. I think it may have been earlier than that. But I'll, I'm going to talk about May 68. I wrote a novel about 68 uh, called Billy Moon. You're for, you froze for me again. Are you, can, did you catch that? I did catch up, but, but, but take it, let me, uh, yeah, just, just take it again. All right. Uh, okay. I'll, let's talk about May, 1968. Cause I, I have some thoughts about that. I I've actually written a novel about it called Billy moon. Uh, so I did research, uh, around May 68 when I wrote that novel. And one of the, uh, ideas that, that I tried to develop when I was writing the book was that, um, the the problem for uh, the the students and workers in 68 was that they were conceiving of their struggle in terms of stripping away um an oppressive civilization and getting to an authentic way of life <clears throat> and uh and i don't think that you can say that that urge to develop an authentic social reality based on freedom and free participation and free exchange um, is neoliberal. 
Um, but it's certainly easy to see how the emphasis on um, individuality and sexuality and uh, breaking free from conformity and participation in what was a Fordist world ended up helping, ended up being part of what developed into uh, neoliberalism down the line. But, it, you know, to urge a return to conformity and a return to um, uh, participation and uh, in, in society and uh, uh, clamping down on individual expression and different kinds of sexuality is clearly no answer to the challenge that the people of 68 brought forward. I mean, it was a worker student struggle. It was not just about cultural issues, but it was started in, in Paris uh, at Nanterre University uh, in protest of the uh, uh, university's kind of parental role, their limits on co cohabitation and co-visitation yeah. on campus. You couldn't go to a girl's dorm room after like nine or something. And that was enough to, you know, start throwing bricks about. And, you know, you're 18, I understand. But um, uh, that did that was really one of the issues at the, the at the beginning of, of, of May 68 and it but it developed from there and there was um, the way I think of 68 is that it was one more attempt amongst many to change society in reaction to um, the growing crisis of, of, of society that you know you uh, you had a, a a decade or two before that where social order was in disarray and young people were feeling that they didn't want to participate in a world that was insane and they didn't see much of a future for themselves even though at the time you know the unemployment levels by today's standards were pretty low it was higher than the norm and um the kind of jobs that people were looking forward to were pretty dreadful um and uh yeah so but i do think that was a moment where we both can look and look back and see the failure of the left, the failure of the kind of imagination that was put forward, the failure to take up um, a real political project and, and compete uh, for state power, and also um, a, a, a legitimate uh, movement for, for social and political and even economic change that, that uh, was driven by the conditions at the moment of, the, of history. Yeah, I mean, I, just as an aside, I think one of the maybe lesser noted consequences of, of Americanization today is that the understanding of 68 is a completely American one, and which necessarily means a more cultural and generational understanding of what happened rather than a political one. Um, and I think this was brought home to me watching uh, Chris Marker's excellent documentary on 68, in which is quite critical of it, especially because he uh, kind of re comes back in the early 90s and reevaluates all that's happened since then. Um, but, uh, you know, he's critical, but he does shed a contrast. And so when he goes to American kind of, uh, you know, archive footage or guests or interviewees, their, uh, th their emphasis is, is already markedly different to the French and Mexican and other people he interviews, um, that, that the emphasis on cultural and generational aspect is much stronger in the US. Um, so that's unfortunate because I think we, we you know, talking about 68, yeah, we just I'm, kind of do this, gen oh, it was generational, I I it was wasn't youth rebelling. Problem. No, <laughs> <laughs> you, you mean you, you yourself in history or in what you described right now? Well, what I described right now and also my novel, you know, because uh, it's certainly an Americanized vision of, of 68, but I do, I, 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 I do think that um, well, yeah. Like, the thing about May '68 and the, and the protests is that there was Americanized at the time. I mean, it was yeah. You know, there was a free speech movement which preceded it, which I think had some effect on the way students around the world were thinking. It also started at an Americanized university. Yeah, uh, Nanterre um, was not uh, structured the way most French universities were. It was um, a very different institution. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the cultural effect of post-war America and, and really post-war developing uh, the kind of post-war economy of Europe had an effect. The media had an effect. The, the, the generational differences had a, a, an effect, but it was also very much about um, uh, immigrant labor and not like trying to limit it, but just the 
really poor conditions of immigrants uh, in, in, in France um, and real worker struggles and, uh, and you know, the impact of the, the colonial war. Um, and yeah, but I, I guess what I'm referring to, I mean, there was a de- absolutely a, a material Americanization. People were, you know, already for, for a while, you know, listening to jazz, wearing jeans, et cetera, whatever, then rock and roll, mm-hmm. Coca-Cola, et cetera. But I think it was more material Americanization compared to what we see, especially today with the internet, which is uh, much more ideological in, in terms of completely flattening the categories by which we understand right. ourselves. And that's, that's a, that's a whole different level, but I, I don't want to, I didn't want to discuss that specifically. I, I did want to actually, you know, you mentioned the free speech movement, I think is interesting because that's one thing which is definitely lost in relation to the 1960s, which is the category of freedom is just absent more or less from the left. Um, right. Because it was completely recuperated by, uh, by, by capital, by the selling of freedom in a bit much more, limited uh, individualist atomized way in terms of consumer sovereignty. And, uh, and, and then that also meant the right in large part abandoning its defensive order in favor of selling a dream of freedom. Uh, and the left as a consequence just went, yeah, freedom is not about us. We're about equality. You know, we're about equality in the state against freedom in the market. Um, and that's been the kind of polarization, which I think is still operative on the left more or less. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And of course, the left should be embracing freedom. The, certainly the socialist left should be because without freedom for workers, there's never going to be a, a, the kind of radical transformation of uh, the economy that will lead to a different kind of society. You, we are the ones who really want freedom. We want, you know, like the Silicon Valley guys are all cucks in comparison to the Marxists. You know, we, we, want, a, <laughs> we, we want the true transformation of society technologically and otherwise. And by that you mean Grimes reading the Communist Manifesto uh, while she's yeah, married we're, to look uh, exactly. Elon Musk. Grimes literally has been. I mean, Elon Musk has literally been cucked by Marx. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's embarrassing. Um, I'm sorry to even bring that up. Uh, it's beneath I, us. I didn't it's mean to. Us. You brought it up. I did. No, I did. I did. I, I accept full responsibility. <laughs> but but and then I finished off the joke, and I'm just as responsible, I guess. Um, but, but but thinking about actually what I was saying just there about this, you know, the left's kind of turned to the state and it gets conception mm-hmm. of itself mm-hmm. as defending equality as against freedom, often quite explicitly. Um, I'm going to kind of hazard a, a typology of, of the left in today in the, in the broadest possible sense in, and in keeping the the kind of what, in, what, it, what I include in the boundaries of the left, even those who would see themselves as perhaps post left or whatever. Right. Um, and And, you know, if you think that this typology is completely wrong or you think that my, my characterization of it is wrong, tell me I'm talking shit, right? Okay. Um, but it, it, it goes more or less as follows. You have, progressive, you have progressivism, which is the mainstream of the left. It's mainly liberals, like left liberals. Um, and its attitude is either tragic insofar as some of them are honest liberals who defend you know, traditional liberal values, civil liberties, and so on. Uh, and they're tragic because they, they just feel that the world is against them. Or most likely, especially the kind of younger um, progressives, are authoritarian. An authoritarian in the sense that the only their only agency effectively is the state, and so they only they can only just appeal to the state to do things and to, for example, ensure equality. Right. So it's ever more state encroachment to areas of of uh, social life. Um, so those are the progressives. The other the the, the second tendency is is uh, populist. Who have all the rebellious energy, but effectively are opportunists because they their general approach is to uh, present a diametric opposition to whatever the progressives are doing, um, and so sometimes that can be useful. Uh, it often can be very useful to do that, but they don't have a particularly dialectical approach to to understanding uh, to understanding that, and often can lead them to kind of odd conservative positions because they're just merely reflexively opposing what the progressives do, um, and then. Uh, finally, I guess you have Marxists, or at least those that I would accept <laughs> are Marxists. So I, I assume that I, I, I accept that that's kind of question begging using that category. Um, but people who uh, would certainly conceive themselves as orthodox Marxists or whatever, I mean, uh, who, you know, might be correct, but they're lonely. Phil corrected me earlier and he said, no, isolated, not lonely. And I'm going to insist on lonely <laughs> because you might be right, but you have no agency, right? Um, so the populace mm-hmm. might gesture at a sort of spectral people or working class uh, or white working class, but th- there's only so much um, real contact that there is there, 
right? Um, it's always very yeah. ephemeral. It's these little moments of insurrection even, but, but which disappear and which are uh, incoherent, uncoordinated, and so on. Um, and, they, and the populace often abandon any intellectual leadership or, or any claim to intellectual leadership over that. And then you have the Marxists who don't, who, who claim leadership, but no one's listening, and their agent, the proletariat, has disappeared from the scene. Uh, so am I talking shit? Is that, did you think that's no, a, a I think, fair no, I think that's accurate. I, I want, I want to throw in another category, but I'm not sure if it's, if I can. Um, but I just think about my kids and their friends and how they got involved in the protests after George Floyd and the kinds of organizations that they tried to form. Um, and they, they consider themselves to be the radicals against the progressive Democrats at the time right so they, they they were kind of contesting the streets so who was going to lead what were they going to what was going to be done where were they going to march um and uh how much disruption was going to be allowed you know so continuing to riot was sort of what the radicals wanted to do um although my own kids of course are completely innocent of all charges but um uh mm -hmm. and th what happened to them was that uh the the, the my kids and their friends and the organizations that they formed was that they became, uh, well, I think they it just kind of became irrelevant, but they, they were not able to become Marxist. They wanted, they were striving after being truly radical agents of change to change the structure of society. They were aiming at going beyond capitalism and at least in their own thinking. Um, but instead they like, would create little struggle sessions. Um, they at one point were discussing, you know, getting back to the land and buying some land together. Uh, they just went at every, it, they just made every single mistake that you could make. It's like they just recreated the new left in, in the 60s in like a two months time that every, everything they could do wrong. Um, but the aim, their self-conception was Marxist, I think, or at least anti-capitalist. And it was not, um, saying, oh, we'll use the state to create equality. They were against the state, right? But they, they were against the Democratic Party anyway, and they certainly weren't for the Republicans. So they were you know, these American and anti-status, but they somehow just became irrelevant even to each other and lost energy. Um, and, uh, but I don't think that they count as the kind of Marxist that you're, you're talking about who's isolated. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the critical, the one critical, you know, uh, kind of come back to that would be, well, you know, they're just progressives actually in denial. They're, they're part of the progressive camp, but in denial. Yeah. yeah. I, I'd be provocative I here. So. I don't know. No, no. I mean, I'm yeah. Just... I mean, I kept, I kind of told them that I said, look, you're, you're going to end up electing Biden. That's what you're doing right now. Hmm. <laughs> you know, and which is not like, I mean, for fuck's sake, I voted for him. So it's not like uh, I have a, I'm, that was a moral condemnation, but um, like they weren't, able to get beyond that but i don't think it's like they were to say they were in denial is to act as though they had an option open to them that they could see and chose not to do it or that their that their self-conception was paramount i anyway what were you going to say something philip yeah i was just i was fascinated um so i just i suppose i'm curious as to why you think they kind of recreated the entire history of the American you left in miniature, or even, I mean, you know, maybe even kind of harking <laughs> back to American populism. Um, and I, I mean, I, you know, no, I mean, uh, I don't know how, how personal you want to get, but I'm fascinated if what you you know, what you're saying is it's your kids. Um, and so, I mean, is it like they're, well, they were my kids friends because my kids are white. So they weren't allowed into the, right. The, there was a, a POC group that right, okay. I was hearing about um but they were you know friends with the, the, some of these people and they were trying to you know they were involved in the the, the actions um but so they have uh, no but they have no history then is that the that, is that why they recreated that history because they have no yeah, history they, they were grabbing things like the anarchist cookbook to try to figure out how to organize wow know? yeah yeah you know they were just they were just any which way they would go to try to find a, a path and they didn't have a, a clear conception of the different categories and most of them had been a political up until maybe that moment yeah um so you know so they were trying to really some radicals overnight but i think that's why they recreated the <laughs> 60s is because they were around a university as well where that had been 
uh, in charge of the con uh, how yes, the yes. left was conceived for you know 30 40 years so that they that is what they understood of the left already they didn't uh, they didn't turn back to 1917 or yeah uh, or, or think through you know uh, the revolutionary moment of 1848 or or conceive of the difference between bourgeois politics and feudalism or any of that kind of yeah. stuff yeah, yeah. they were they were they were thinking about uh the, the starting with the sds really yeah um, so that so that's campus culture and then i guess that is the genuine influence of the academic left right but it's on these these kids weren't all students they were just living in a college town yeah and in fact they were in opposition to some of the democrats who were coming out of directly out of the university you know they didn't they didn't they wanted a break from the, uh, the university but here's the repetition again, right? That it's somehow history before 1960 is uh, a kind of a black box. And what is taken to be left politics, the default assumption is do 1968 again, effectively. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? It's um, what one of our, I mean, it's what one of our interviewees said in our um, generation series, the editor of uh, one of the contributors or editor of the American conservative um, she made this point about the how it's understood because 68 is held up as the apogee of radical politics um, in the university effectively and in kind of wider culture and given kind of the influence of the left insofar as it is influential in wider culture, then the instinct is that, well, if you want, poli if you want kind of um, authentic radical politics, this is what you have to do. Right. Yeah. Yeah um and uh right which means you have to fail yeah <laughs> yes exactly yeah, and, yeah and, that's right yeah and and glorious kind the, of failure and the generous and the generous interpretation i'd sometimes kind of older people will be like oh let the kids make these mistakes let them learn for themselves uh these things which i think is absolutely wrong um because we have already done that over the course of a number of uh, maybe not whole generations but cohorts um, which we've been describing here, the 90s left, the 2000s left, and so on. And to, in many, in, in their various different guises, all in different ways repeat the failings of the new left over again in yeah, a I mean, historical moment, which makes it even more impossible for that politics to, the, to be realized. The reason why, you know, Gen Xers and, and boomers say, oh, let the kids make the same mistakes again is because they have no idea uh, how to avoid those mistakes themselves. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And they're unwilling um, to take responsibility for them as well, I think. Right. But th the other thing is that since that time, the notion that the, the youth were the radical, like revolutionary subject kind of took hold of the left, too. So, like, uh, I was I remember being involved in the left when I was in my 20s and I was thought of as being, you know, the important young person in the room who was going to make change. And then being very disappointed as I entered into my 30s and, and then oh, even worse in my 40s, no longer being important to anyone and on the left and needing to shut up and sit down and listen to these kids who didn't know shit <laughs> you know they came into organizations um but i mean it's i think an unfair burden to place on people who are trying to come of age and figure out who they are and in, in their teens and early 20s to tell them yeah you need to lead a radical revolutionary struggle for massive social change and you need to figure it out on your own i mean that's crazy <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, and but the, here, here's where the you know to, to use my typology uh, for better for worse, where the populists at least um, have a have a leg up on on that sort of general approach, and that they're willing to break with the entire history of the left. Of course, the problem is that there's also there no real engagement with it. So instead of repeating, it's just a complete dismissal and not really an engagement of with the question of okay where did the left go wrong or what were the specific contradictions of different moments of the left um which you know i have problems with some of its, it's interpretation more... but this is to the benefit of the, you know for example of platypus sort of interpretation with trying to digest the history of the left has has a uh, has going for it at least i think but i don't know who, i mean i don't know who those populists are who deal with the history of the left i mean um no they don't i mean that's my point yeah but i mean i'd say the at least um Populist, nas nationalist, national populists. Um, 
I think they, you know, they have far, and this is, I mean, this is, you know, we're far from the only people to say this, but they have far more kind of insurrectionary um, and um, kind of rebellious energy than anybody else at the moment. And that was the thing that was kind of most striking about the um, January Capitol, January 6th Capitol Hill riot was, you know, while the left was kind of um, pulling down cultural symbols, it was the right that was actually storming um, institutions of political power but then when they you know when they kind of breached the citadel they had nothing you know nothing there was all kind of a silly a silly carnival they had nothing to do or to say when they were actually in the room i, I um, would say there that's the right repeating 68 as well but their own yes. version of not, not yeah. repeating their own 68 but repeating the left 68 but because no, it's I'd the right agree. wing and it's an even more perverted version it's the carnivalesque now migrated yeah. over to the yeah, populist you know, right no i'd agree entirely all I mean is, though, that the you know the that kind of um, the willingness to scrap existing institutions of the status quo that seems to me to be much more prevalent on the populist right than it is on the left at the moment. Look, I think that the you can't discount the amount of disruption and mayhem and willingness to be rebellion rebellious that was taking place during the riots after George Floyd. I mean, and they they did surround the White House. Trump was forced to hide in his basement. Um, it, you know, I, I, the I, I what what I think the real taboo here is is that the similarity between the January sixth moment and the and what the left was doing, the the incoherent uh, nature of both moments is uh, you know important. But I don't I I I talk to people who are like a, a adjacent to QAnon or at least one guy, and I I don't think that there's a real, rebelliousness there that's very deep yeah and, and, how'd you, know. you mean uh, um it's rebellion the the, the uh, on the on the populist right the rebelliousness is re turns quickly into a uh, desire to like retreat into your uh underground bunker and hide out with your canned goods it, you know it, it's not yeah. you know and to take vitamin d and <laughs> yeah. uh and <laughs> and, and and buy the right kind of uh, testosterone supplement or something. I mean, it's 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 individualistic. Um, it's not it's not really focused on institutions, but on uh, the, and seemingly the obsessed party. obsessed with the threat and masculinity by the sounds of it. Yeah. Well. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm talking to a guy. I mean, you know, I'm sure there are uh, women who are a part of this that that are not so focused on on synthetic testosterone or whatever but, but the point is, yeah i mean um, i i think the the scenario is a little, probably a little bit different in europe where i mean that idea of retreating to your bunker isn't isn't even a kind of a cultural trope um but right, i mean right but but just to conclude so maybe we should raise this because we haven't even talked about the pandemic really and the kind of politics oh, that's yeah, been I out just, from that um partly because i'm i'm a little bit sick of it but also it's unavoidable so here we are um okay but there's there's a case where you know Phil talking about you know insurrectionary energy on on the populist right. Uh, that's a case where you know protests and riots against vaccination mandates and lockdowns, uh, whether justified or not. In whatever case, you can't be you, you can't but be taken aback by the I guess the energy and the willing to dismiss not just uh, the the kind of political mandates imposed from above, but even the, the the terms of knowledge that they propose, right? Which I think is is dangerous because it can lead into kind of conspiracy theory territory and so on. Um, but nevertheless, I, I'm I'm kind of of the opinion of like you shouldn't be anti-vax, but if that kind of emerges into a kind of mass uprising, I think we have to somehow uh, engage with that in some way or take it seriously and not just dismiss it that there's something going on there. I wonder more about the labor shortage and 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 the rolling strikes that are going on uh, than I do about the mass man uh, the the vaccine mandate and the resistance to that. Are are, are those things connected at all? Or um, because that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I, I feel what, as what though, rolling strikes are you thinking of? Well, just apparently, I've been, I mean, no, look, I'm not. I, I I've been sort of out of it, but. I've just heard that there's major labor shortages and that there have been strikes throughout the United States that, that sort of are underreported. And, um, and I look, I haven't researched it, so maybe I'm full of shit here, but uh, I do know that there really is a labor shortage and the unemployment rate isn't that high. And we've got an increase in, in homelessness that I at least is visible to me. And all these things to me seem to kind of be connected. 
Uh, so I think a lot of people have been pushed like off the employment rolls permanently in the United States. And yeah. Yeah. Um, and so you have uh, a kind of lumpen population um, and then, and also somehow a willingness to maybe end up in that position uh, after the pandemic um, because people aren't coming back to work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's something uh, we discussed and, a couple of episodes ago about whether people are, are just effectively dropping out of the labor market entirely. Right. And so, so that's a very strange phenomenon. I don't really quite understand it. I mean, I, I, I definitely feel as though when you're talking about the left, are the left's embrace of uh, the the power of the state right now is misguided. It's specifically now. I mean th that the, the, the there's got to be a way to uh, reach out to the, the, the just to, to recognizing yourself and in other people the need for social freedom and to mm. to get beyond to, to demand some way out of a perpetual state of social distancing and crisis i mean yeah, uh, absolutely uh you know i i don't know what the technological fix will be the vaccines haven't quite done the trick yet um but uh you know to to look at workers who are resisting the i mean i i think the perverse thing is that the resistance to the vaccine is a manifestation of a resistance to social distancing and lockdown and perpetual crisis of COVID. And that in, in a lot of people, it's like a weird psychological reaction. Yeah. Um, yeah like I the, think, I think yeah. that's probably right. Yeah. Um, um, and <clears throat> so that's, that's a lot, somewhat the fault of the state in the way that the, the vaccine yeah. rollout was handled and not making it clear that the whole point of the vaccine is to let people have social freedom and to let them have a, a social life again, um, and the, the the trepidation around, uh, you know, the transmissibility of of the COVID amongst vaccine, you know, the vaxxed is uh, was really misguided. Um, yeah, but so I definitely think that that the left needs to get its shit together as in terms of how to think about the the post pandemic world and and not fall in line with the, you know, the build back better Biden administration or what, what have you. But that doesn't mean that we should like become anti-vaxxers. It just means, you know, we got to think through how to relate to this moment better and insisting upon the right to organize and be, uh, come together collectively. And uh, especially, you know, as the homelessness crisis worsens and people are suffering from lack of employment and maybe permanent lack of employment, um, has got to be top of the list. And I'm going to be talking to Richard Wolf in the next couple of weeks about his stance on the vaccine mandate. And he's taken the position that he's against it, um, which has made him unpopular uh, or semi-canceled. But uh, I think that it's at least worth discussing as to why people might oppose it. Okay, very good. Uh, I think we'll leave that here. It's been great to chat to you, Doug. And you're going to have to tell yeah. us once again, no. tell the people where to where to go and where to subscribe for their well, things. Well, after my next, you know, cancellation of because of the comments I just made about the vaccine, <laughs> <laughs> you can find me uh, at uh, YouTube, uh, uh, Doug Lane on YouTube, uh, it's D-O-U-G-L-A-I-N. You can go to my Patreon, that's Diet Soap, that's D-I-E-T-S-O-A-P, Diet Soap on Patreon. Um, I'm on Facebook. Look me up. Uh, I have a Twitter account. It's just my name. Um, but there'll be more to come and, and more things that we'll be doing. There's a podcast at dietsoap.podomatic.com. I'm going to find another platform for it as well. And uh, yeah, I'm out there. I'm, I'm going to be making the rounds. Brand Doug. Brand Doug is circulating. Very good. Uh, <laughs> all right <laughs> cheers it's been good it's been good to talk uh and that's yeah. it for now catch you later bye-bye all right bye-bye okay, so that was fun thank you guys yeah no cheers Wonderful. thanks for your time thank you very much